Can I ask you a question? It requires some context. I do some exercise. One of the things I do is treadmill. Do you realize how cruel it is to put someone like me and probably someone like you on a treadmill? A treadmill. You're saying I need to be on this thing that is the literal representation of the figurative futility that represents my life. And I need to do it every day. This hurts to think about. Some people listen to music when they're on a treadmill. Some people watch TV. After all, something is required, yet nothing is enough. Nothing is enough to stop me from being increasingly mortified with every step. Why not take it one step further? Forget the treadmill. Get your cardio digging your own grave. 30 minutes to an hour on the grave digger every day. It folds up. It will slide easily under your standing desk. I mean, they say never forget where you came from, but how about never forget where you're heading? So that, that was the context, futility. And now I can ask the question, which also I lied. It's not a single question, but a series of questions. And they're fun. It's another lie. Have you learned to accept the fact that your life is compromised? Do you feel cheated? Is there something you want to change so badly that you can't let go of the fantasy or the implied promise of what it could mean? Do you ever feel so certain of something, but that something depended on another person and their thoughts or their feelings on the matter? Uh, it didn't line up with yours. Have you experienced the moment yet where you panic and think, was that it? If you haven't, you will.
Do you believe that consciousness is a nightmare? Do you think subduing the truth by any means necessary is the only reasonable and logical conclusion, the only lasting poultice that can ameliorate suffering? And can you do that without hurting others, even indirectly, I mean? I mean, ultimately, is everyone just trying to make their lives feel less bad? And for some, that necessitates, from their point of view, inflicting some kind of harm on another. Insidious, sometimes even innocuous. If so, what is the moralistic thing to do in a situation like that? And for me, the answer is heavily implied, but it's a solution condemned both by society and our own biological programming, as well as just by abject cowardice. What if joy is really a form of acceptance of the inevitable? What if the highest state of being we can achieve is actually just coming to terms with our own impending fate? And when we do that, when we accept that this accomplishment or this partner or this family, or this work. We accept that that will be enough for us. What we're really doing there is feeling the relief of letting go of our aspirations, our juvenile ideas of what we thought life would be, and not just what we would accomplish in life, but how it would feel. what we would be like when we were older, what the additional perspective would grant to us or rob from us. Joy is deciding. This will be enough for me, and then weeping at the great compromise that always, always falls short of the promise we were so wickedly imbued with as children. That'll do, pig. That's joy. What a horrifying realization. There are those who, if called upon to represent the ups and downs of life on a graph, would do it something like pain, nothing, joy. With the implication there being the natural state of being is neither suffering nor joy, but some nether state in between. I think this is a lie. I'm quite certain that the natural state of being is suffering, and that to achieve the exalted state of nothing requires quite a bit of effort and joy. Even the joy we speak of here, the muted joy, the joy is the illusion revealed, is much more difficult, much more fleeting. 
and much more likely to persuade an otherwise moral person to look the other way if sustaining that feeling requires the suffering of another. Yeah, the hard truth is that most of us would not walk away from Momolas. We would live there and feel quite comfortable, possibly even get angry, indignant, if it was pointed out to us that the reality of the machine churning out our relative comfort was fed by the agony of another. We surround ourselves with those who thought like us and would, in short order, realign the relative scale of morality so that the now innocuous pain in our lives and the pain that that pain inflicts on others is considered well and good, necessary, or at least too deeply entrenched to do anything about. And those who complain about it are ridiculed, not because anyone believes them to be wrong, but because they might make those who reap the rewards feel worse than they currently do. Which is not to say that they feel great anyway. Hmm. It's understandable. These people spend a lot of time doing the mental gymnastics necessary to not feel so bad. And they would appreciate it if you would kindly fuck off with your incessant, but don't you realize this, and this isn't right. If the highest joy is the Stoics acceptance of life as absurdity, and the Stoics are, well, as Stoic as they purport themselves to be, then wouldn't they be just as content to live in suffering if that meant taking the burden from another? Because they're not quite as stoic as they make out. I'm punching up here. It'd be very easy to punch down, apply this to religion, particularly Christianity, which is, of course, a, a tangle of lies predicated on other lies. There's more questions. Sorry, not sorry. I hate that phrase. I also hate if that makes sense. But I can't say why. Do you feel frantic at every moment? Do you not feel distracted enough? Are you fighting with everything you have in you to not see through the veil? And do you desperately want someone or something to cover your eyes in a more effective, believable way? You feel like you can't escape the truth, no matter how much you want to. Do you think that atheists like being atheists? Do you think they enjoy it? People like Richard Dawkins, Ricky Gervais, they claim to, but that's only because they like to lord it over others as evidence of their superiority. Deep down, I sense they both fervently wish they believed in God. They're getting what consolation they can in their panic by being dicks to other people about it. I certainly wish I 
believed in God or something, anything more than what we know. I don't want everything to end. Many people claim to have reached a state of ego death through meditation, drug use, whatever the method, and claim that they have no fear whatsoever of death as a result. That they see time like an ocean. And they've always existed. And they will always exist in this one patch of time over here. And just because they don't exist in this other patch of time over there, where's the tragedy in that? They equate space and time, and science does that in part two. And pat themselves on the back, claim to feel better. And we're all just shitting our pants, and hoping we get some consolation out of this induced groupthink. Because it doesn't matter, ultimately, regardless of whether or not multidimensional beings see time as motionless or eternal or whatever, we're still stuck. We're stuck in the experiential lockbox of our sad, linear, time-bound, three-dimensional brains. And we will be till we cease to exist, we will continue to be horrified by the idea of not existing. Anyone telling you otherwise wants to sell you something to take their mind off their own impending doom. Bank on it. There's money to be made there. Maybe you had a friend when you were younger who claimed you didn't understand something because you hadn't done a particular drug or been to a particular place or listened to a particular piece of music or something else equally vapid. Yeah, that person was an asshole. Trying to feel better about themselves by standing on your head. It's a load of bullshit. We all jumped out of a plane at birth and are now hurtling towards the ground. We'll hit it with velocity sufficient to create our own graves. And we spend our time approaching our respective termini, contemplating different ways to slow our descent or pretending that the ground is just paper thin. And when we hit it, we'll break through to another much larger world. One in which we can fall forever and never have to worry about the ground ever again. And maybe we form circles and hold hands, sing, make pretty patterns in the air for a few moments. We have babies, they get thrown out of their planes. We look up at them and watch them and love them and maybe even slightly envy their higher altitude. But for all of us, the bottom line is solid, unforgiving, immovable object. And even sadder, is the fact that distractions are often most effective when they're horrible, when they're terrible. The, one way, the only way to beat the fear of death is to choose or be thrust into a position where you suffer so much and so acutely that you actually wish for it. Some of us have or will have this dubious distinction foisted upon us 
whether we want it or not. If you're in enough pain, you won't wish for anything to end it. But it doesn't sound like a very fair or just solution. It seems like spite. It seems like cutting your tongue out because you tasted kale. And there are so many distractions, countries, allegiances, religions, sex, drama, disease, poverty, children, money, celebrity, entertainment, storytelling, making videos, ambition, hormones, starvation, and plenty far more horrible and we tell ourselves that we're lucky, almost all of us, regardless of our station. Someone always has it worse, and if things get too bad, we always have the option to flip the switch. There is always an out. You can only use it once. You don't really know what sort of pain it will leave in its wake. For most, it seems like probably just best to spend the rest of your days on the treadmill. It'll come soon enough. Don't knock ignorance. Ignorance is grace, and knowledge is not intelligence. Sometimes the far smarter move is to not know something. Our only goal is to navigate life in the most fulfilling way possible. The intelligent being would do that by focusing where focus enables that fulfillment. And they would keep their eye on the ball. And the natural follow-up to a platitude like that is usually something like, don't get distracted. <laughs> Of course, getting distracted is, in this case, the point. So get distracted by the thing that is the most effective at distracting you, or the suite of things that are the most effective at distracting you. Keep your eyes constantly peeled or anything that might do a better job. As long as that change in focus does not abandon or otherwise hurt those you have been distracted by up until now. And even then, you're gonna have to take it on a case-by-case -case basis. But with a little luck, you could maybe even be distracted right up until the moment the lights go out. tiring doing this. I can't imagine how tiring it must be to hear it. But then again, sleeping is roughly a third of our allotted time accounted for. And dreaming is a pretty effective distraction. So if you feel it coming on, might as well embrace it. 11 p.m., fine. Noon? That works too. Take it when you can get it. And it's like a magic eye poster. Don't focus on it or it won't happen. Just pretend nothing matters, which should be easy because nothing matters. Maybe you fall asleep, maybe you don't. If you don't, maybe there's a good movie on you can watch, or better yet, a, a bad one. A boring one. Maybe you can listen to this again. If it didn't bore you the first time, it's sure to bore you the second. And the third, 
Oh, oh man. The beauty of the ASMR video. The more time you times you listen to it, the more boring it becomes. And the more effective it is at doing its purported job. But that's okay. It's fine to fall asleep on a metaphorical treadmill. I can't recommend it on a literal one. And that's it.